Hello and thank you for being with us here on Talking Europe on France 24, where today I'll be speaking to the European Union's ambassador to the United States, Stavros Lambrinidis. This is uh, very much a time, of course, when transatlantic relations are playing on many European minds. It is now 20 years since the September 11th attacks and people in Europe and around the world, of course, remembering the almost 3000 people who died. Well, many leaders here in Europe also taking this moment to reassess their relations with the United States. Already in 2021, we've seen President Joe Biden come to office seemingly promising more harmonious relations than under his predecessor, Donald Trump. But President Biden has frustrated and angered many European partners just months later by pushing on with the US pullout from Afghanistan, with the chaotic consequences still unfolding as we speak. Well, Stavros Lambrinidis, uh, thank you very much for joining us uh, from Washington, D.C. Great to be with you, Catherine. I'd just like to start off by asking you, uh, where were you on September 11th, 2001, and what do you remember of that day? I was, uh, I was in the Greek foreign ministry. Uh, I was uh, an ambassador at large at the time, and uh, it was uh, early afternoon in Greece. And um, uh, what I can remember is the, uh, is the absolute disbelief and shock. Uh, there was a little TV in the kitchen next to the uh, uh, minister's office and uh, and uh, someone shouted and I ran in uh, and a couple of other people also ran in and we saw the first plane uh, falling on on the first uh, tower and uh, I can tell you in an instant um, we all felt we all felt that this was an attack on us as well it was it was very guttural uh, it became supremely clear uh, that um, democracies were being attacked, our values were being attacked, not mm -hmm. just uh, a particular tower in a particular country. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, for those uh, few hours after that, um, in addition to trying to understand what, what, what was happening, we were trying to figure out how to express in the most unconditional way uh, our feeling that we were all Americans at that moment. Mm. The most pressing issue in the transatlantic relationship right now, arguably, what's going on in Afghanistan. And it's true that the US pullout was done with little consultation with uh, European states or other partners. And it really caused chaos uh, for those states uh, and their citizens in Afghanistan. Uh, given all of this, was Joe Biden, in fact, irresponsible to insist on going through with this withdrawal the way he did? Well, I mean, we've had we've had discussions about this with the with the administration, but let us not lose the focus of this, uh, the real tragedy in Afghanistan is for the Afghan people themselves. After uh, decades of bloody fighting, um, they are where they were. Uh, and of course, it's a major setup for the international community. What we are focusing on as Europeans here is, is, is the immediate future, mm -hmm. uh, not the past. We have a direct interest in what happens in Afghanistan, whether it is with protecting uh, Afghanis who work with us and they need protection leaving, or, or with dealing with the potentially massive uh, migration and refugee flow, uh, or dealing with the drug uh, trade, or certainly dealing with terrorism and radicalization. So all EU foreign ministers got together and said, look, we have to work with the uh, new government uh, because there are things that we need to get done immediately. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We need to make sure that people can still leave the country. We need to make sure that humanitarian aid to go directly to the people that are starving now in Afghanistan can go through without impediment. We need to make sure that, uh, you know, the Taliban stick by the word and uh, terrorism does not flourish again in that country. We need to make sure that human rights are respected. And let me just say something about that last point. You know what? The Taliban a few years back planted a bullet in Malala Yousafzai's head, a young girl in Pakistan that was advocating for women's education. Now, if terrorists are giving you a signal that they hate educated and empowered girls, Guess what you should be doing as the international community, ensuring that those girls are getting educated. We did this in Afghanistan the past 20 years. Yes. Human rights is not soft policy. Mm -hmm. It's hardcore foreign policy. And this is one of the things that we're doing. But if I may say, Catherine, very quickly, there are more things that we have to look at and we're looking at now. How is it, how it is that we can support neighboring countries in Afghanistan uh, to handle the refugee flow? How it is us as Europeans that we can learn a lesson from this Indeed. and become stronger militarily because it was very clear that we didn't have the capacities in Afghanistan as Europeans to be in there alone. And so to yeah. protect and to ensure that we can play our equal part in uh, security, uh, mm -hmm. including in NATO, but also defend our interests, we have to be out there doing more ourselves.
Well, indeed, and this has been uh, said by several EU leaders themselves. However, at this point, there is no such thing as an EU army in the same way that there's a United States army. It's the biggest member of NATO. And there was this absolute uh, uh, very difficult situation, as the co Commissioner Thierry Breton has said. Uh, people have noted that European states weren't consulted. On all of these issues that you've just mentioned, uh, human rights and uh, security, uh, surely... Europeans must have less confidence right now in being able to rely on the United States as a partner looking ahead where the US is still the biggest military force in the world, the biggest security force. I, 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 think, I think we're looking more inward on what we can do more ourselves to become stronger and better. Uh, if you see what has been written and said in the past few days, you will see that all the EU leadership have emphasized that Afghanistan cannot. It would be a tragedy if it became a moment where Americans and Europeans decouple. We have to be even even closer together. Uh, and at the same time, uh, we are even way before Afghanistan, this withdrawal, uh, thinking as Europeans about how to become more credible security providers ourselves. Keep in mind, we're already out there as Europeans. Off the coast of Somalia for many, many years, piracy has been virtually eradicated because of a European-led military force uh, mm. out there. But uh, we also know that we need to invest much more together in, uh, in uh, military capabilities, and we need to deploy more together. And if we do so, we're doing it to make sure we can protect our own interests in cases where the United States or someone else is mm -hmm. not willing to jump us. But we are also becoming a much stronger, much more credible ally in NATO, which is our collective security umbrella. In so... These things are not contradictory. In in terms of protecting European interests, as you say, uh, it's interesting that on Friday, the head of Britain's MI5 internal security services said that uh, he believes that the Afghanistan pullout increases the risk of attacks by extremists. He talks of them having a morale boost, uh, the risk of more well-developed, sophisticated plots. Is Europe actually less safe because of this pullout? Well, I think everyone has to make sure that we do not become less safe. Uh, this is something that, uh, as I told you before, it was one of the main interests and concerns of the EU uh, when it came to Afghanistan. Uh, and so dealing both with the uh, radicalization that may increase in Europe uh, by people or groups that uh, somehow feel inspired by what happened in Afghanistan, or dealing more directly with people who may be from Afghanistan itself, uh, who may try to infiltrate uh, Europe uh, or the United States or anyone else for that matter, that is absolutely a concern of us and we are very, very focused on it. Uh, the EU's foreign policy chief, Joseph Borrell, uh, spoke recently about establishing a 5,000-strong EU uh, so-called rapid reaction force. Uh, I'm just interested in the idea behind this rapid reaction force, what it would actually do, and whether there would be a clash with NATO, of which America, as I mentioned, is the, the biggest military force. No, I mean, there certainly wouldn't be a clash with NATO. As I said, uh, the, Europe's having uh, the capacity to have more independent military capabilities and presence and deployment around the world is not a new thing. Uh, and, uh, and in fact, to complement uh, NATO, a stronger EU, uh, by definition, would complement a stronger NATO. Uh, but at the same time, I would say that this is one of the many uh, uh, ideas and discussions that are on the table right now as the European defense ministers and foreign ministers discuss what we call this European strategic compass. So there's a real open discussion now for a document to come out that would indicate strategically where we think that Europe needs to be uh, in order to defend its interests better in its neighborhood and around the world and, its, and in its alliances. So um, there's no conflict. Fundamentally, what is needed uh, in Europe is political will. Um, uh, we are 27 different member states. Um, uh, defense is mm -hmm. a national And we have managed, nevertheless, uh, to, in the past few years, to pool our military resources much more effectively. We are at the beginning stage of this, um, but we are moving on. And the United States actually is participating uh, in some of our projects. Uh, one recent project, military mobility, ensuring that in Europe we have the capacity to move real fast uh, the, the right military and the right equipment we need in the crisis points that may arise in our continent. That is a huge exercise. Europeans decided to resolve it together, and Americans applied to and have been accepted as a member of that coalition in that project. So uh, no conflict at all.
Just away from uh, security and defence matters, there are a host of other areas where the EU wants to have strong cooperation with the United States, for example, on uh, global corporate tax rates, on climate change. Are we seeing movement on these areas? Are we seeing the EU and US come together? Yes, and the EU-US summit in June, where President Biden met with uh, with uh, President uh, Michel and President von der Leyen in Brussels, was uh, the, 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 the kickoff of this uh, of this joint effort. Look, we are 780 million people together, uh, sharing values and sharing the biggest economic relationship in the world. Uh, we uh, committed uh, to fight COVID and to um, kickstart the world economy together. We committed to protect the planet and to also move on to green growth. Uh, millions of Joshua people together. Uh, we committed uh, to um, working together for more investment, more trade, more technological cooperation. And we committed to work together for more democracy, more human rights in the world. These are only things that can be achieved if Americans and Europeans work together. And I think that under the Biden administration, clearly there is a willingness for that cooperation and there's absolutely a willingness on the part of the, of the EU. We are not, look, when it comes to COVID, solidarity to other countries is not charity. Unless we fight this in every corner of the world, we will not be able to fight it in our own countries as well. We see this with Delta right now. So when Europe has been out there from the beginning, leading the effort to vaccinate the world, uh, allowing the export of European produced vaccines, the same number uh, to other countries as went into European arms, that is solidarity extraordinaire. That is leadership. Ambassador Lambrinidis, thank you very much for speaking to us on Talking Europe. Thank you so much. And thanks to you for watching as well. Do stay tuned to France 24.